talking a little today about what every technology should know about AI and deep learning. And first of all, I'm going to ask the question, do we have anybody who's dealing with AI in the audience? Good, you can help me out. No, I'm serious, that's serious. Hey, never be too proud to say you know, don't know everything. So my involvement with AI starts way back in the late 1970s when I met a gentleman called Professor Donald Mickey. I don't know if anyone's aware of him. Uh, he was a professor of informatics at Edinburgh University. And he started an AI program way back in the late 70s that died a death, because AI died for a long period. It was what they called the AI, AI winter, where AI really didn't make very much progress at all. And the reason wasn't that we didn't know how to do it, the reason was we didn't have enough processing power to do it. The computers weren't fast enough. The kind of algorithms we were using were very compute intensive, very data intensive. And to be quite frank, if we had done AI back in the late 70s, early 80s, I think it would have been a minor miracle. And things have moved on since then. Has anyone ever heard of a gentleman called Lee Soddall? Lee Soddall, name ring a bell for anybody? Nobody plays Go, you know, the uh, ancient Chinese game, 19 intersecting lines, white and black pieces. Lee Soddall was the world champion at Go, and he retired two years ago because he was beaten by a program called AlphaGo, which was developed by Google in their DeepMind labs. And AlphaGo is such a strong player that it's actually taken centuries of Go knowledge and added its own playing techniques that are very powerful. In fact, it's so powerful that it will beat any human player. Now, the way that AlphaGo was developed was by taking a very large set of data from Go games that are recorded and then working out strategies based on, di so it's directed learning effectively. What it was doing was looking at existing games and existing masterful techniques and applying those to the game of Go to develop its own playing ability. And it's better than any human. So Lee Soddall decided to retire because, you know, things would never be the same again. And then DeepMind decided to destroy another game. If the destroying is what they're doing. Anyone heard of people like Alakine? Morphe, Capablanca, Karpov, Kasparov, Fisher, chess. It's chess I'm talking about. And they developed a similar chess program. The, 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 the best chess program at the time, back in 2018, was a chess program called Swordfish. And it, it is actually a very powerful chess engine, but it's based on learned moves, again it's a directed learning algorithm and it's a, basically a deep tree search. And it is very powerful because it knows many of the opening lines. A, in chess you, 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 you have bo opening books. And many chess games are known, that, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 15, 20 moves out. And it's fairly rare in modern competition to get a brand new game until you get to about the ninth, 10th, 11th move. So there's a set, sets of openings. And they taught Alpha Chess, effectively, version one, opening books, etc., etc. So it was a fairly traditional thing, and it beat Stockfish, which was quite something in its own right. Did I say Swordfish? I said I mean, Stockfish, I beg your pardon. There's too many of these fish around. We've got, you know, Sneer have got Swordfish, it's Stockfish. Then they've developed something called Alpha Zero. Now, Alpha Zero is a chess program. It is the best chess program in the world. The current holder of the highest ELO rating, and the ELO rating is your, basically your, your strength in chess, is a guy called Magnus Carlsen, who has an ELO rating of around 2,800. It's the highest it's ever been. Alpha Zero has an ELO rating of around about 5,000. Alpha Zero has never lost a game of chess to anything. The only thing it loses against is itself. 
And do you know how long it took to teach Alpha Zero chess? I'd like you to guess. How long did the training algorithm take that Google developed to get this monster, because it is a monster, to play chess? How long? It's between the two. It's four hours. And they didn't teach it any chess. All they did was gave it the rules of chess and let it play itself. And in four hours, it beat the strongest computer program we had to date, Stockfish, and will beat anybody and anything. I mean, it is an immensely powerful program. But in four hours, it taught itself chess. Now, that is what this is about. This is about an attempt. Who, that was 50 euros. I did one. <laughs> um, this is just an attempt to give you an introduction to the essentials of AI and some of the work that we in NetApp are doing to try and use AI in our own products. It's, this is not a product pitch, by the way, so don't worry about that. And in fact, it's so not a product pitch. I've got a disclaimer up front that says, we might do something about this, we might not. And if the things that we do look like this, then well done. If they don't, well, hard luck. Okay, so this, that's the standard disclaimer. So why is AI and deep learning important? Because for the first time, for you know, a, two generations probably, two or three generations of, of, of computing science, we're actually at a point where we can do AI properly. We can do stuff that we've never done before, like, for instance, build killer applications like AlphaZero that knew nothing about chess, and then four hours later was the most powerful chess beast in the world. So for a long time, AI was about approving algorithms, and we've got to the point where we've got a sets of algorithms that we can now work with, and I'll talk about some of them. And now the focus is on putting it to practical use. So I'll talk a little about the background and then a little about what, we're put, what use we're putting it to. And no presentation on AI would be complete without an XKCD. So there's the random XKCD for you. Okay. So I'm going to give you a quick AI primer, the, 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 the software stacks that are in common use, the deep learning process, uh, the systems that are used. Uh, I'll talk a little about the data sets and the data flow because the way that you deal with data in AI is quite different from the traditional way of dealing with data. And a little about the future, a real little about the future because it's, it's, it's pro you're probably better placed to see the future than I am. I was going to try and get a video. There's a video out there of a Google car doing uh, driving around the US street and marking up all the objects that it sees in real time. <clears throat> and AI has got to the point now where it's actually got better vision than the average human being. You know, it can see things you can't. It can see cars that are about to move. It can see pedestrians behind cars that have gone out of sight and coming back into sight again. It's quite an incredible video. <coughs> Excuse me. So, AI or ML or DL. There's an old joke in AI that goes as follows. AI is what you do when you're going out to get seed funding or doing a series A, B or C round for funding. ML is what you do, or machine learning is what you do when you're putting a team together and statistics is actually how you actually execute on it and you just use your traditional techniques. And that, that's a bit like this. So effectively, AI or ML or DL or deep learning. So the, the, the difference between them is AI is a program that imitates human intelligence. Or actually, I think that's actually a really poor definition. Because AI, in the case of Alpha Zero, isn't mimicking human intelligence at all. It's doing th something quite unique. Its playing style has been described as brutal. Now, the, you know, the, the, the playing style of Stockfish is very mechanical. And in fact, a good chess player can identify when he's playing against a machine, if it's stockfish, but not against Alpha Zero, which has been described as brutal. I mean, the words brutal have been used. This is a different level. It's not imitating human intelligence. It's way beyond that. So imitates it to a degree, but improves on it as well. <coughs> ML is a program that learns with experience. In other words, if you give it more data, 
it will learn more, it will become more accurate, for instance, and I'll give you an example of that when we're trying to identify uh, a set of photographs. And DL is ML using a neural network, so deep learning is basically machine learning using a neural network. Okay? And I'll, I'll explain what a neural network does in a second. So it's like a Russian doll. Layers thereof. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I hate hotels. The air conditioning is so aggressive, it dries everything out. It's a lovely day out there. You wouldn't know it in here. Dreadful. Right, so basically what we've got, a neuron uh, is a computational unit. This is an attempt to describe a neural net, a very simple neural net. And basically you've got a neuron, which is a computational unit that takes inputs and has outputs. So it takes inputs, does things with them, and I'll explain what it does with them, and then produces outputs. And the DL is the type and the structure of that model, how it looks. More layers, better capture, larger neural net, more accuracy. So the idea is that you build this neural network, and the larger that it becomes, or the deeper the layers, the more accurate the results can be after training. And then you've got parameters and weights between each of the neurons. So effectively, what a neuron is doing, or the, the, the individual element within a neural network is doing, is taking inputs and modifying them to generate outputs based on parameters that it has. And that might be a simple thing like, for instance, uh, matrix table multiplication. So it might be taking in in inputs wide and outputting M units deep in terms of its outputs. And it might be a matrix multiplication that we're doing, and that multiplication uh, could, it is based on parameters, so the parameters are part of what's fed into the, to the process of actually calculating the outputs. Training is taking that data, raw data, and then doing what's called forward propagation. Now, the way we do it is we take raw data. ML is not about giving, with the exception of alpha zero, which is quite unique, where we want to give it the rules. ML is not about giving it the rules of how to identify a mountain. It's about giving it literally thousands to hundred thousands of mountains and telling it that this is a mountain. So we actually tell it what we're expecting as output. And if it says, you know, you give it a picture of a mountain that comes back with a dog, you adjust the parameters until it says, oh yeah, right, mountain. And then we keep refining that process and we repetitively do it. And that's forward propagation. In other words, we take the data, we tag the data with what it is, we run it through the net, and we hopefully get the right answer at the back end for each of the items while we're going through this training process. And effectively, we're building a model and then that model will be used when we're actually running that neural network to identify the objects. Backpropagation is the way that we actually generate the parameters. And we modify the parameters that we're using in each of those neurons, the elements in the neural net, to actually get us the right result. So forward propagation is pushing the stuff forwards, letting it do the calculations, hopefully coming up with an answer. And the backpropagation is saying, no, you are wrong and then propagating back from that all the way back through the neural net and adjusting the parameters and hopefully when you push it forward again you get the right answer at the back end oh, sorry, the right answer at the front end depending which end you consider to be the front and the back okay so there are some issues you just repeat, you keep doing this until your, your model's accurate there are some issues associated with training that are fairly well known that you need to be aware of. Uh, bias is one of them. And notoriously, facial recognition provides us with the ideal uh, opportunity to be outraged. Because facial recognition is one of those key areas where this kind of process is being used. And bias in facial recognition is a, is a real problem at the moment. Is anybody, are, you, are any of you doing facial recognition nets, no? Okay, the big problem they've got is they're not very good at identifying different women. That's number one. And number two, they're not colorblind. 
because some of the training sets that have been used don't have enough information about persons of color and they misidentify correspondingly. Now that's a big problem. It may not be a problem for mountains, but it's a big problem for human beings. So bias in the input set is very, very difficult to eliminate and needs to be looked at with a lot of care. Also, if you're doing autonomic, autonomic driving, as Google are, bias could be absolutely lethal. To give you an example, stop sign is recognized as not a stop sign, but as something completely different. And that does occur. Uh, sometimes the algorithms are confused by something next to it. So you have a stop sign, and next to it is a hand. And instead of identifying it as a stop sign, it identifies it as a human being with a hand out. You know, because well, stop sign doesn't look like a human, but in terms of the data set it's been fed, it's unable to make that differentiation. So, you train it, you pass over the entire data set, you keep repeating this until you get the results you're looking for, and eventually you end up, and this is just actually talking about the way the data is the, the handled, uh, and I'll talk about how the data is handled in a second when we get to the, the, how to, uh, the, the kind of technologies and tools that we use to, to uh, um, analyze the, these data sets. So inference is now where we take this learned model, we've implemented the model, you can give it new data, and hopefully when given data that looks like that, it comes back with the answer, mountain. That's the theory. In practice, it's, you know, depends on what we're asking it to identify in this case, but you can get fairly accurate results. Um, inference also doesn't require as much horsepower so if you think about building the model in the first place, building the model takes a lot of processing. In fact, when Alpha Zero was being run in its training mode, the four hour mode, it takes in excess of 512 CPUs and gobs of RAM, and huge amounts of RAM to actually develop these models. When it's running in inference mode, it only requires a laptop. It can actually run on a laptop. You know, our killer chess player is laptop sized. But to build the model, use an awful lot more horsepower in the first place. So inference is basically taking all that data, sorry, machine learning is taking all that data, building the model, and then the inference engine is simply taking a single instance of it and identifying it correctly. DL at scale is pretty impressive. You can end up with hundreds of layers, millions of parameters, and to be quite frank, not gigabytes of data. Most people are operating with terabyte sized data sets, multi terabyte sized data sets, hundreds of terabytes in many cases. And it takes quite a bit to train. You know, you're, you're talking hours to days to do a, an adequate training exercise. So, what does the stack look like? So basically what we need at the bottom of this stack is some compute. And I met a nice PhD student last night who told me that we've run out of letters of the alphabet for PUs. Because we've got CPUs, no well, custom to that. We've got GPUs, graphic processing units. And now we've got TPUs, which are tensor processing units. And I'll explain what a TPU does in a minute. But we're running out of, apparently we're running out of the first letter that there are they're all occupied. We get APUs, BPUs, DPUs. <coughs> so we basically need a lot of compute. And the best place to get the compute is to rent it. And you can actually go out and rent quite a large amount of this stuff on, 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 on uh, Google, for instance. And it is not particularly expensive um, to actually put together the compute to, to run some of these uh, applications. Um, anybody here from large supply like Google or Microsoft Azure or? There you go. So if you want to rent some stuff, this man will have business cards to give you. <laughs> but that's the place most people do this, they rent it on the cloud. 
the, the second thing that we need is a bunch of software. So with the, there are a variety of software tools that allow you to build uh, these models. Uh, TensorFlow is Google's, PyTorch which is a Python based uh, set of tools that allow you to build them. And there's a whole bunch of others, including the entertainingly named Gluon, which I actually thought was a physics particle, but I might be mistaken. I don't know what quite quite it's called, Gluon. Um, it is, right, okay, there you go. So basically these are libraries and, and bits of uh, interface code that allow you to build models uh, on top of the, the computer environment. Some of them are quite specific to the computer environment. So for instance, TensorFlow is quite specific to Google's uh, uh, TPUs that it provides. Then you need a platform. Guess what? A laptop will do because we're doing most of this in the cloud. And in fact, running the model afterwards, once you've built it, laptops are more than adequate. You, you don't need huge amounts of compute power to do the actual running of most of the models. Uh, which is why you're able to put these things in cars, for example. Or in the case of, uh, if you're into civil liberties, in the backs of police vans for scanning faces. It doesn't require a huge amount of compute. It doesn't require much sophisticated technology to run this AI once we've developed it. <coughs> Excuse me. So you, some, you sometimes need hardware accelerated platforms as well though. So in the case of, for instance, again, Google, if you develop a TensorFlow application, then you're going to be tied to Google because you're having to rent the TPUs that provide you with the actual uh, uh, calculation ability. TPUs, by the way, just specialized CPUs. I'll explain what they do in a minute. And then you've got an API-based service that can sit on top of it, and it's Microsoft Cognitive Services, am I right? See? You got a label. <laughs> it's nice to be able to sell somebody else's technology for a change. Oh, IBM. Which, which one's IBM's? Watson. Oh, Watson. Yes, Watson. In fact, that's a really good point because NetApp actually have an existing AI application called Elio, which is a, a, a diagnostic assistant. Uh, and when you first communicate with NetApp, you're not communicating with a human being. You're communicating with Elio, and Elio is attempting to do problem diagnosis and it solves about 75% of our initial contact queries, which is pretty good. It's based, it's based on Watson, yeah, yeah, LEO. Okay. So the deep learning process, it's quite unlike traditional software development. It's, it's actually a, an unusual, <laughs> What it's, what's really unusual about it is the way you have to deal with the data. Because your data sets coming in that you're training on tend, tend to be, there's only one word for them, vast. That's one word. The other word for them is annoying. Because you have to tag all the data. So all those pictures of mountains I'm going to be training this system with, I had to tag with the word, or some identifier anyway, that identified them as mountains. And in fact, I may have multiple tags on my data. So I may have, for instance, tall mountains, snowy mountains, small mountains. Is it a small mountain? Hill, that's what it is. So I've got a variety of ways. I have to tag all that data. And that is an exceptionally labor-intensive process. I mean, that, that can literally take the bulk of your time is finding somebody else to do it. Because to be quite frank, you don't want to do it. But these things need tagged, and then they need certified. You actually need to go through your data and say, have I correctly tagged all the mountains with, as mountains? Because the last thing I want to have in there is a dog. Okay? And for your training algorithm to recognize all dogs as mountains, because there happened to be one instance of a dog in your 100,000 pictures of mountains. So there's quite a lot of data analysis that needs to go on in the gathering phase. 
that makes it quite unique. It's quite different from anything else you'll ever do. This is not like running an Oracle database. Then you've got to train the model. You've got to evaluate the model. Now, model evaluation is really quite difficult as well because you need another set of data that is correctly tagged that you haven't trained with. So if I've got 100,000 mountains, I'm going to need probably 1,000 or so other mountains that the system has never seen because that's what we're trying to do is artificial intelligence, not, not, not forced pattern recognition. So it needs to have not have to have seen this data so that you can then analyze your model to work out whether the model's accurate or not. And then you need to monitor it because AI is just, is just like people. It's unreliable. It's not 100% fail-safe. And if you're running a nuclear reactor based on AI, don't. You know, there, are, there are lessons from history there. One of them is Chernobyl, for instance. <coughs> so it is actually quite a different life cycle from the normal development life cycle. Um, this, this is one that's beginning to get to me, actually. This is really important. Data security and privacy is a big issue because we're beginning to do stuff with AI that is beyond just simply tagging and managing inanimate objects. We're doing it for people and things that people do. Um, you know, there is a certain tension there, and there are, you should be thinking about uh, the legal aspects of what you're doing while you're, while you're doing it. So, the deep learning training, how does it do it? Building a model from the data set. This bit that we do the forward propagation, work out whether we're getting the right answer, do the back propagation to adjust the parameters and keep rinse, you know, allow the rinse repeat and keep going through it. It's memory and compute bound, and they're big data sets as I said, and there's some quite complex maths, but it can be simplified. So initially when we were doing these kind of models, we were using floating point. And, and I don't know if you're familiar with Intel's floating point, for instance, it's got 56 bits of precision. That's far too much for these kind of models. They don't need that kind of precision. And in fact, something that's only like seven or eight bits of floating point. So you know, doing things like multiplying two numbers together, instead of them being highly accurate, you know, 0.73215 six times 0.1, etc. No, we're doing, it's roughly 0.7 multiplied by roughly 0.3, and the answer is roughly 0.2. That'll do, yeah. Okay, so it's, 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 it's very, you know, arbitrary. And in fact, you can replace quite a lot of it, and a lot of it's now being replaced by integer calculations instead of floating point kind of calculations. It's highly parallelized, or it needs to be highly parallelized, because if you don't parallelize it, you'll never get through it. The training phase is so intense that you actually do need to parallelize a lot of this. You can either partition the data, or the model, or both depending on what you want as an outcome from your training. And you've also got a speed versus accuracy trade-off, which is not apparent until you've actually run your first model. And if you've ever seen the output from, from early models, you run the model, you think, this is really good. My test data set is identifying you know, uh, 95 objects out of 100. That's a really great pass rate, 95%. Well, I've got some news for you. As soon as you get out there in the real world, it changes and it drops off steeply because the real world's a lot messier than your, uh, your sample data. Uh, federated learning is also a way of doing it where you, you actually try and build several models at a time because you're actually taking the same data and using it for different but similar modeling exercises. So, for instance, you might be identifying snow or snowy scenes and you might use your mountain data set with snow as uh, a model for uh, some other uh, model you're trying to build, or rather input data for some other model you're trying to build. Um, how do you improve data quality? How, how do you improve data quality when you're doing training? Let's take the picture an analogy again, mountains. How do you improve the data quality? You asked the Chinese to do it. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> That's one way of thinking of it, yes. It needs, it needs quite a lot of labor to prove, improve the data quality. There's only one thing going to improve the data quality, and that's human. It's not another 
is not another piece of AI. Although AI may be helpful in doing so, if you've already got something that's able to identify quite accurately mountains and it's AI, then why are you building this model in the first place? I mean, it's, it's kind of catch-22. But it does require good data quality, and that is actually quite difficult to achieve. It also requires to efficiently fit in memory. So that may require different types of uh, data, not just straight compression, but data reduction. To give you an example, you may have a model that you use to cut out the sky part of all your mountain pictures. So that you may have an early primitive model, and what it's really good at is identifying blue at the top of a picture. And it can strip all that out, get rid of all that piece, and then just present you with the, the mountain piece. So it need, you, you need to think about transforming the data. It's not just a case of taking you know, a billion pictures and expecting to get this to fit in memory. And it will need to fit in memory at some point. Because remember, all programming is an exercise in caching. Uh, supervision, Joe, you, so you've got this uh, idea whereby you can transfer learning. You've got a pre-trained model, and you can actually get it to thank you uh, help you w with identifying the data, doing the pre-labeling. So you may have a simpler model that isn't what you want. Uh, you want to refine it, but you can use it to, to help you with the data. Parameter tuning is always a, a, a problem. And remember that a lot of the parameter tuning is done using back propagation, which is a statistical technique that might actually introduce errors. Um, the, 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 you know, you're attempting to get a, a minimum on a graph, and you might end up finding a false minimum. It's not actually the minimum. It's a local minimum rather than a, a global minimum. And that kind of thing can actually produce quite a lot of errors and needs to be eliminated. But you can automate that. There's a, there's a, actually, you can do trial and search. At, at, trial and error searches to automate that process. And that's how AutoML does it. And that's how uh, AlphaZero does it as well. In other words, <coughs> there's no modeling or tuning required. You just give it the rules, and it tries to work out the best way by, by self-analysis. So inference, computationally sim simpler, you can do it on a laptop, it can be done on a single pass because you've built the model and it's only forward propagation. Now you've got the thing you want to identify and hopefully we get the right answer at the back end. So simple implementation. And low latency, that's the other thing. Now we can start putting in cars because it's not taking hours to analyze, it's taking microseconds rather than longer periods. So the DL models, though, can be huge. They can be really, really very large, and it depends what you're analyzing. Um, Google's DL models for their uh, vision, car vision, are, are exceptionally large because they have many, many different items to identify. Uh, lines on roads, signs, people, moving objects, stationary objects, shops, houses, weather. So there's a this huge number. And they may require a lot of hardware acceleration. Uh, and so a lot of it's been done at the edge in terms of the analysis, where you can actually prune the data at the edge or do a primitive analysis right up front and then send back data to be further analyzed at the center. Uh, portability, and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a standardization effort actually underway which I've not yet looked into in any depth. Onks, I think it's pronounced. So, very quickly, I'm going to run through because I'm, ru I'm beginning to run out of time. Still use CPUs, but we're using much more specialized processes. And in particular, accelerators like GPUs, which are really good at doing floating point arithmetic very quickly. They're not very much good at doing very much else, to be quite honest. And in this environment, basically what you're doing is offloading a lot of the computa computation to a GPU. Now, what this is actually forcing us to do, I don't know if you notice the word InfiniBand here, it's also forcing us to think about the way that we transfer data across internal buses. And that's providing a lot of impetus, by the way, in terms of communication technology. 
give me two, two minutes. Uh, I talked about reduced precision. We can start doing things instead of multiplying very accurately. We can do this approximately uh, thing whereby we're actually, the, the operations we're doing are not particularly accurate. They don't need to be particularly accurate. So we can do them much more uh, effectively. And TPUs are the tensor processing units. And basically what they are are reduced floating point multiplication units. And that's what they do really quickly and really fast. Uh, they're the specialized ASICs, basically, that allow you to do these uh, high-speed operations. And as I say, they're beginning to be replaced by integer units as well. Uh, FPGAs. Anyone programmed an FPGA? Oh, God. Well done, you. They're a real pain to program. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and also specialized devices for things like Echo Dot and various other bits and pieces. So the software frameworks that we're beginning to see, the front ends like Keras and Gluon, and the back ends like PyTorch and TensorFlow and various others, and each, each supplier of these in the cloud will have their own preferred variety. So very quickly, I talked about data and the impact all this has on data. Here is our raw data on the left, and, on the, and with the size and the frequency of the size of the picture that we had. And here's what we do. We actually pack it up, we compress it into things called TensorFlow records, which are just basically big blobs that contain uh, multiple images. And those multiple images are then fired at the model and the reason for doing that is you can't swallow all the files simultaneously to do this through memory. You need to slice them up into handleable units. And this actually affects the way that we store and manage data and get it through the system fast enough. So you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot of storage technology being directed at this kind of data processing, which is quite unlike any other kind of data processing that we currently do. And then you simply shove it through uh, CPU and RAM through the network, read it, prepare it, push it through, and throw it away. It doesn't get written back out again. And the idea here is that we do a lot, as much pipelining as we can, because what we really want to do is parallelize this operation, and again, that changes the way that you handle the data and the way that you configure systems. Very parallel operation required. And then the same again with the preparation and the parallelized I.O. essential to make these models workable. Quick in the future. Expert assistance. Simplifying deployments. The things that Alan talked about this morning, uh, sorry, Andy Wall talked about this morning in his presentation, uh, that will really help us in automating tasks that humans find incredibly boring or difficult to do, recognizing patterns being one of them. So, key takeaways. Simple application, complicated way of dealing with data, Things done at scales you're probably not accustomed to. But AI is coming and everybody's going to have to get used to it and learn a little about it. And the other thing is, don't bother learning chess. You'll never win. Right.